Hello, my name is John Osborne, and together with Ebony Holiday, we are your virtual hosts for today's post-election investment commentary presented by the Wealth Management Team at Mechanics Bank. Our job is to assist the panelists with the technology side of the WebEx, and with that in mind, please welcome Dave Wissinger, Senior Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager for Mechanics Bank. Dave? Thank you, John. And thank you all for joining us. We have a lot of information for you today. So let's begin right away. Next slide, please, John. These are the topics we'll be discussing today. I'll be talking about the uh, status of the elections and any policy changes or modifications that we see coming as a result of that. And then Alexei Bolonkov will talk about the pandemic and any possible economic stimulus that we still see coming from that. Todd McGinley will discuss the economy. And last but not least, Kelly Gaynor will talk about the markets. So let's get started. Next slide, please. On October 14th, we noticed this graphic was published from uh, the Bank of America Investment Research Department. And we liked it a lot because it, it shows the different scenarios that might come from the election and how that might affect the economic stimulus that we see uh, as part of the pandemic recovery. So interestingly, back on October 14th, it looked like the best and worst scenarios would come into play if Joe Biden was elected president. If he had a Democratic-controlled Senate, then probably we had the best possible story for stimulus. If he had a a Republican-controlled Senate, then we probably had the worst possible case with very little or no stimulus. Now, what we see happening, and we'll discuss this in a lot more detail in a minute, is that, in fact, Joe Biden will be in the White House, and it looks like there'll be a Republican Senate. But so far, the stock market is not projecting that this idea of a deflationary economy based on little or no stimulus is going to come into play. So let's look at the election in more detail. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Well, if we look at the three branches of government, Uh, The executive branch looks to be Joe Biden in the White House. The legislative branch or Congress looks to be split. The House will still be controlled by Democrats, and that was never in question. Uh, Nobody was projecting that uh, the Republicans would flip the House, but the Democrats did lose some their margin of majority. And then the judicial branch um, is tilting conservative with a – late in the game appointment of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. I saved the Senate for last because we have to talk about that in more detail. It's not quite settled yet. So let's look at that now. Next slide, please. When we prepared these slides, there were three states with undecided Senate races, but now Alaska and North Carolina have both decided in favor of the Republican uh, incumbent. So that leaves Georgia with two two races. Both of their senators were up for re-election, but neither one of them received more than 50 percent of the vote. So there's there's going to be a runoff election um, to decide who the real winner is going to be. And that's important. We'll see why in a minute. Next slide, please. The two senators that are up for re-election were Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. Kelly Loeffler is running against Raphael Warnock and David Perdue is running against John Ossoff. It's a fact that Georgia has not sent a Democrat to the Senate since 1990, 20 years. So it's been a solidly red state. But interestingly, Kelly Loeffler is new to the program. She was appointed to the Senate in December of 2019 to replace her predecessor who retired for health reasons. So she's never been elected, and we don't quite know how she plays in a full statewide election. We're projecting, or or for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to say the two Republicans win. But if they don't, the Senate will be tied. 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans. And that leaves Kamala Harris, the vice president, casting the tie-breaking vote. So even even if the, um, the Democrats win, then it's a Democrat Senate, even though it's 50-50. So that's not the that's not the scenario we see happening. We think the Republicans will win in, in Georgia. Okay, next slide, please. All right, let's look at some of the policy changes that we see coming from that scenario. 
So who would raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour? Biden says yes, he would. Trump has been a little bit unclear on that, but leans no. Who supports the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade deal, otherwise known as NAFTA? Trump supports it. In fact, he had bipartisan support for the modifications he made to it during his administration. Biden supports it, too, but he said he'll make his own changes going forward. Uh, Next slide, please. Who supports the Made in America policies? Well, Trump does. This was actually a big part of his 2016 campaign when he talked about bringing manufacturing back to the United States. And he expanded it during the pandemic, um, issuing an executive order that required certain essential drugs and medical supplies that are purchased by the federal government to be made in the U.S. Biden supports it, too. In fact, he adds penalties or would add penalties to uh, strengthen the mandates. Okay, next slide. Who supports the Federal Reserve operating independent independent of political pressure? Well, that's the way the Federal Reserve is supposed to operate, but certain presidents are a little bit more intrusive into their business than others. Trump, for example, was very supportive of the Fed when they were going in his direction and very critical when they weren't. So he was he was kind of an interactive president with regard to the Fed. Biden says he will let them operate independently, but politics are politics. We'll see how it goes. Who supports the eviction moratorium during the pandemic? Both Trump and Biden do. It's hard to imagine anybody getting elected right now without supporting that. Next slide. Who supports funding for up to 12 weeks of paid family leave for workers? Trump supports it, but in a somewhat limited way. Biden supports it, but in a much more generous way. As you can tell, details are limited right now, but that's the way they came down on it. And you can expect to see more paid family leave for American workers with Biden in the White House. Who supports the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal? Trump was a big no. He campaigned against this um, in 2016, and he withdrew from it when he was elected. Biden supports it, but says he'll renegotiate. And it's worth noting that he helped draft the original deal, so he'll be a supporter. Next slide. Who supports tariffs on goods from China? Trump supports them. In fact, this is the basis of the trade war with China. Biden says he'll reevaluate the tariffs. Um, He's been very critical of Trump's policy toward China, so we can definitely expect some changes here. Okay, next slide. Who supports extending the $600 per month federal unemployment insurance benefit? Trump doesn't support the $600 level. He supports it, but more like at a $300 per month level. Biden supports it, but in sort of an unclear way. He's He wants to see some extended benefits, but he is not committed to the $600 level. So we'll have to see where that comes out. We see this as being significant because consumer spending during the pandemic is critical. Next slide, please. Who supports cutting Social Security? Well, Trump's a little bit unclear on that because he'd been considering a cut to payroll taxes as some financial aid in the pandemic, which may have affected Social Security benefits. But there was never any decision made on that. And Biden says, no, he won't cut Social Security. And who supports the 2017 GOP tax cut? Well, obviously Trump does. That was his tax cut. Biden is kind of a no. But what he means by that is he'd eliminate tax cuts for corporations and wealthy individuals. But he's also promising no tax increases for anyone earning less than $400,000 a year. If you're earning at that level, that puts you in the top 1% of all earners. So effectively, Biden is saying he won't raise uh, income taxes on 99% of earners. Next slide, please. Who supports increasing capital gains taxes? Well, Trump was no. In fact, he was considering further cuts to capital gains taxes. Biden's a little bit split on this. He plans to double the capital gains rate to the top 39.6 marginal tax rate but only for those earning more than $1 million a year. So if a $400,000 earner is in the top 1%, 
a million dollar earner is in the top one tenth of one percent. So he's he's saying his capital gains tax will really be effective for almost no one. Who supports increasing the corporate tax rate? <clears throat> Trump's a no. Biden's a yes. He'd raise the corporate tax rate to 28% from 21%. Next slide, please. Who supports reparations to descendants of enslaved people? Trump says no. Biden's a maybe on this. He's open to studying the idea. There are a lot of different ways to look at this, and nothing's been decided. So uh, with Biden in the White House, this is something that may come to pass, but it's probably going to take a while to sort out exactly how to figure that, figure out how to do that. Who supports opportunity zones, which are tax, which are um, which create tax incentives to encourage investment in struggling communities? Well, Trump does. In fact, this was part of his 2017 tax reform. Biden will also support them, but he wants to reform the programs to prevent corporate profiteering. Next slide. We have to mention health care here. Uh, because Trump tried so hard to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, which is Obamacare, made some headway, but never really fully eliminated it. And and this was something that was passed in March of 2010. So it's 10 years old now. And it'd be very difficult to fully pull a 10-year-old program out of the economy. Um, but Biden gives it his full support. And that makes sense because he was part of the, the, the Obama administration that put this into play. Next slide. Also have to mention the Green New Deal. Now, with a Republican Senate, it's not likely this will pass, but we want to talk about it because in case it does or any parts of it do, it's a big deal. It's, it's kind of an economy changing proposition because it cut it. It affects almost everything. So, for example, it transitions the U.S. to 100 percent renewable energy using uh, electric cars and high speed rail. It implements a social cost of carbon, which was part of the Obama administration's approach to climate change. It calls for universal health care and an increased minimum wage. So this is a far reaching proposition, which has a much better chance of seeing reality with the Democrat controlled Senate. But as I've said, we just don't see that's the way it's going to play out. Next slide, please. Okay. To conclude on the policy discussion, you may have noticed there really isn't that much difference between Trump and Biden. The most controversial differences would come into play if there's a Democrat-controlled Senate. But for now, Wall Street is celebrating political gridlock, expecting no dramatic changes, and we'll be talking about more of this to come. So I'm going to hand it off to Alexi now to talk about the pandemic and any kind of economic stimulus that we, we may see. So, Nate uh, uh, touched on the things that uh, are similar uh, between the two administrations, and then uh, it seems that both parties do agree on the necessity of the stimulus. There is no, uh, there is no debate there. However, they both see it very differently. So, uh, the Republicans in the Senate, and as we're recording this, we're acting under the assumption that the Senate was going to the Republicans. Uh, they are seeing stimulus as more reactive rather than proactive, and the House Democrats disagree. They see the stimulus as being something proactive, something that's necessary uh, in order for the economy to avoid falling into uh, into stagnation again. So uh, essentially, uh, in October, uh, the House Democrats passed a $2.2 trillion stimulus bill, and um, the Republicans see it more like uh, – 500 billion. So between you know, 2.2 trillion and 500 billion, uh, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And uh, whatever the gridlock uh, yields, this will see. So the point is anybody's guess, but I think it's safe to say that we don't we're not going to see the 2.2 uh, trillion stimulus. Uh, on the next slide, I'm uh, <clears throat> uh, I placed a screenshot of uh, what the office of uh, President-elect Joe Biden have, uh, Biden Harris campaign uh, put up their uh, plan, the emergency action to save the economy, and uh, it does cover 
uh, the vision of uh, Biden-Harris campaign and what it would look like coming out of this uh, COVID lockdown and out of the economic slump. Uh, realistically, as we mentioned, it's probably going to be uh, different, um, different based on what can, on the compromise that can be achieved. Uh, but at any rate, uh, any stimulus package will probably will likely have five uh, key components. Uh, component number one uh, is the extension of unemployment insurance. Again, as we're recording this in November, uh, the, a lot of programs are set out to run out of money, out of funding in December. So something has to be done about it, and something has to be done about it quick. Uh, whether the unemployment will be uh, $600 a week or $400 a week, that's being uh, negotiated. Second, uh, PPP funding, uh, funding. So the Paycheck Protection Plan, uh, that program has been well received and it also is running out of funds. So something needs to be done to replenish those coffers and uh, make sure that program is still running and that the aid to small businesses and entrepreneurs is still available. Uh, third component will mostly be like, uh, will most likely be in the form of direct aid to local governments, state and local governments. Uh, probably with a large chunk going towards schools so that uh, the education for our kids can go uninterrupted. Uh, fourth, uh, we expect a public health uh, awareness uh, campaign, so more efforts put into uh, making people aware of the benefits of social distancing and masks and uh, everything else that helped us flatten the curve through the winter months. And then uh, Finally, uh, direct payments to individuals. So unlike most of the previous QEs, this time the new money that's being inserted into the economy is going directly to the people who need it most. So it goes directly to the end recipients. Uh, some of the previous QEs uh, had a mixed results because a lot, of, uh, a lot of this money ended up in assets, in real estate, in stocks and bonds, or even in the savings accounts. Uh, this time, the payments are going directly to individuals, directly to Main Street Americans, and uh, that is designed so so that the economy picks up and the money starts circulating. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I'll talk about how uh, how the stimulus will likely look like. Uh, we don't have any details yet, but we do know it's probably not going to be as generous as the previous stimulus. Uh, there are a lot of things that are still being debated. Uh, who will get it, who won't get it. Uh, for now, uh, we, things we know for sure is that it will likely be necessary to have a social security number to receive the stimulus. Uh, the individuals making over 99,000 will probably not qualify. Uh, there will be a uh, phase out between 75 and 99,000. Uh, if you are head of the household making over 146,000, you will out likely not qualify. Or if you're a family uh, filing jointly and making over 198,000, uh, you probably won't see the stimulus check. So the stimulus checks will go to those uh, to those needs. Uh, a lot of details are still being worked out. So, uh, for example, there is no clarity on whether uh, these two, uh, the teenagers uh, under the age of two, uh, or students under the age of 24 whether they will get the check. Uh, whether non-resident aliens will get the check, whether spouses of non-resident aliens are eligible for the stimulus, uh, and uh, a lot of many other caveats, uh, for example, people who are behind on the child support or people who are incarcerated. So all of those details have been worked out, and we're running against the, against the deadline here. But uh, in passe is very dangerous uh, because the, uh, the whole point for the stimulus is to, the, is to relieve the impact that this lockdown and this pandemic uh, have uh, had on the economy. Uh, as we're recording this, our base case scenario, we believe that uh, the stimulus will be most likely reactive. It will not be large enough to cause the you know, Biden boom, uh, and uh, which is fine because the recovery, at least at this point, appears like it's all sustained. So stimulus definitely will not uh, hurt. It will definitely not interfere with anything that's already going on in the economy but uh, we don't think that a huge stimulus is necessary. And if we think back to 2008, uh, when uh, the economy was coming out of the Great Recession and the stimulus that happened back then, I think this can serve as a good guidance of what to expect, where uh, Democrats were very keen on 
more robust stimulus, and the Republicans insisted on more fiscal uh, uh, conservatism. And as a result, uh, the stimulus did have an effect, but it was nice and uh, it was uh, slow and steady, and uh, it was not uh, a boom uh, pattern. So, of course, uh, the path that the stimulus negotiations will uh, take depends very much on where we stand in the pandemic. So in the next couple of slides, uh, I would like to talk about pandemic and uh, where we stand right now. With, uh, <clears throat> again, as, uh, as we will put this presentation together, the good news came that uh, the vaccines are being developed and now we have potentially a, a weapon to fight the pandemic. The important thing to keep in mind is that uh, it takes time. As we as we're recording this, the cases are still surging. So the new tests uh, being administered, the new cases are uh, being detected every day. Hospitalizations and deaths uh, on your screen, you see a set of four charts: one addressing the last 90 days, and one addressing the um, uh, the data since inception. It's very difficult to find good, reliable, timely data. So our data comes from the COVID tracking project, uh, which is uh, run by volunteers and people submitting big data. And then, uh, so don't necessarily rely on those numbers. Uh, we suggest you do your own research, but this is the best uh, and most reliable set of data that we could find. Uh, on, the next, on the next slide, uh, the same data is broken down a little bit differently. So uh, as of a couple of days ago, when, we, when I was putting the slide together on November 8th, uh, the total cases were uh, 9.8 million. Right now, uh, we are approaching and just crossed 10 million. Uh, the new average cases or the new daily cases were at 110,000. As I'm sitting here today, it's 115,000. And the change over seven days is, uh, is accelerating. So the, the pace is picking up. And for the first time, uh, we see COVID cases rising in all of the 50 states. So this, this is somewhat alarming. Uh, the uh, hospitalization numbers are going up. Uh, and then the only silver, silver lining is uh, the data on the next slide. We're looking at mortality. Uh, we actually see that uh, the fatality rate for COVID-19 cases is going down. And uh, that probably has to do somewhat with the public awareness of the um, of the epidemic. Uh, people are getting tested, people are getting treatment earlier. Uh, on the next slide, we see uh, the same data uh, by age group. So the encouraging part there is that the survival rates are pretty high. So for people between 20 and 40, the survival rates are in the 99%. Uh, 99%. And then uh, 70 and up, the survival rates are lower, so they're 94% but still, still encouraging. So social distancing, masks, and uh, precaution, precautions are very important because some populations are more vulnerable than the others. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about vaccine briefly. So uh, there are 57 vaccines right now in clinical trials and 87 in preclinical trials. Uh, 38 of them are in stage one where uh, the, the dosage and the safety is being addressed. Uh, phase two, we have 14 vaccines where uh, the, uh, it's being administered to groups or control groups of people and see how that works. And then 11 vaccines are in phase three stage where uh, it's administered to thousands of people and the side effects and the uh, efficiency rates are being tracked. Uh, six vaccines uh, worldwide already received an emergency approval. So some of them are being administered as we speak. Uh, encouraging news comes from Pfizer. Uh, their vaccine showed 92% efficiency rate. So, uh, but again, the, uh, the important thing to remember is that having a weapon to find this pandemic doesn't mean the pandemic is over by no means. Uh, it's probably going to be another six months or so before we see the economic effect that the pandemic or that the vaccine is having on the uh, on, on, uh, on the economy. And uh, to talk about more, to talk about the economy, here's our very own senior portfolio manager, Todd McGinley. Todd. 
Thanks, Alexia. I appreciate that. That's a good uh, transition to my section to talk about the economy. Uh, as with any economic uh, presentation, uh, as you can see on this next slide, uh, there's always uh, an upside and there's a downside. And so this presentation won't be any different uh, from, uh, from that. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, you can see that the uh, pandemic has had a very dramatic effect on the economy. Uh, what you're looking at in this chart is the growth of the economy over the last four or five years. We started out at about $17.5 trillion. Uh, the economy grew pretty gradually but consistently to $19.5 trillion. Uh, and then uh, this uh, spring, the pandemic arrived and all of that progress was lost. Uh, so four years of progress uh, uh, lost in the first and second quarters of this year as the lockdowns and stay at home orders uh, took effect. Uh, but you can see a nice V-shaped recovery. Uh, once some of the lockdowns were uh, released, people were able to re-engage, were able to go back to work. Uh, you can see that there was a nice sharp recovery in the third quarter. Uh, that recovery has not continued here in the fourth quarter. Uh, if we could draw uh, an extension of this line, uh, the next segment of this graph would be flat. Uh, and then uh, the next section after that for the first quarter of next year would, would also be flat. And so we are uh, still about 4% down from the peak where we were at the beginning of 2020, which is about a trillion dollars, which is a massive impact, uh, of course, to the overall economy. Uh, and uh, very few, uh, very few policies, very few uh, effects, uh, economic developments can have such a large impact on the overall economy. For example, the 2008, 2009 financial crisis and uh, a Great Recession, that also had a 4% impact on the overall size of the economy. So uh, we are, uh, even though there's been a recovery, we are still in the midst uh, of, of uh, a recovery, uh, but we're still suffering, there's about a trillion dollars of missing output. Uh, there's an awful lot of people uh, that need to be put back uh, to work, uh, which brings up the next slide. Uh, you can see on this slide, uh, which is total U.S. employment uh, over the last 20 years, uh, has uh, seen some ups and downs. Uh, the way to read this is that the line at the bottom uh, is 130 million employed people, and the line at the top is 150 million employed people. And so you can see that in the 2008-2009 recession, we lost about 8 million jobs. And that took us a couple of years to recover, uh, but we steadily put uh, lots and lots of people to work over the last 10 years. You can see that there was a nice consistent uptrend in the amount of employment. And then, uh, similar to the last slide, uh, we fell off a cliff uh, in terms of employment. We went all the way back down to the starting point. We lost the 22 million jobs as a result of the lockdowns and the stay-at-home orders. And again, here's this nice V-shaped recovery. Once some of the uh, lockdowns and restrictions were released, uh, we were able to put 12 million people back to work. Uh, but you can see that we still have another 10 million, million people that are still out of work and that are still uh, suffering uh, and need help, uh, that uh, their unemployment benefits are beginning to run out, uh, and uh, until we get a vaccine, uh, the people who work in hospitality, entertainment, leisure, uh, food service, this sorts of thing, uh, they're probably not going to get back uh, to work fully uh, until the vaccine is, is rolled out um, nationally, you know, probably March, April, something like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the federal government, uh, to their credit, stepped up quickly uh, to support the economy with uh, so many people out of work, $2 trillion worth of missing output. Uh, the federal government um, came up with the CARES Act, the PPP loans, uh, the un extension of unemployment insurance. Uh, and so the way you read this particular chart is 
if, if this is the federal uh, deficit as a percentage of the overall economy. So if there was no federal deficit, the, the, the black line would be at the zero point. Uh, and you can see that over time, uh, we've had periods of growing federal deficits uh, and shrinking federal deficits as a percentage of the overall economy. Uh, you can see again in 2008, 2009, uh, where, again, we had a, a, a bad recession and we had a federal support for the economy, the deficit, which is a negative number, right, because it's a deficit, uh, expanded from minus 2% of the economy to minus 10%, so about a reduction of about 8% of the economy. And then starting in about 2010 uh, to 2016, uh, there was a, a start-stop recovery in the amount of the federal deficit as a percentage of the economy, and we got back to about a minus 2.5% uh, position when the current administration took over and uh, increased certain spending uh, activities and uh, made, a, made a large federal tax cut. And so you can see that the federal deficit as a percentage of the economy uh, gradually expanded over the next three years from minus 2.5 percent uh, to minus 5 percent, and then uh, once again just fell right off of a cliff uh, as the economy contracted uh, and as the federal government stepped up with very needed, very valuable support for the economy, for the people in the economy. Uh, you could see that the federal deficit expanded from minus 5 percent to minus 15 percent, a 10 percent expansion. Uh, almost overnight, uh, and is still uh, is still uh, expanding. The uh, fiscal support uh, that uh, Alexi was just talking about uh, will also have to be borrowed uh, because we're already in a position where uh, we're in a in a deficit spending mode, which is appropriate. Uh, this is what the the government is there to be able to do, and so thank heavens that they are willing to do it and willing to step up. Uh, like many of our trading partners, almost everybody in Europe is doing this. Uh, everybody uh, in Asia uh, is doing this as well. Uh, and uh, it's it's just to create a bridge to enable us to get from before the pandemic to uh, after uh, the pandemic. So we would expect that some of this uh, federal deficit uh, to recover fairly quickly. But again, we'll we'll have a little bit of a V-shaped uh, uh, appearance to the chart, uh, and then uh, a more gradual recovery after that, uh, more along the lines of uh, 2010 to 2016, uh, maybe one or two percent uh, improvement in this statistic uh, per year. Um, the federal government can continue uh, to deficit spend. There's no limit uh, to the amount of deficit spending, but uh, uh, eventually it has to come to an end. Uh, eventually, we, we will have to pay those bills, uh, and so uh, in all likelihood, uh, the, this will reverse course uh, fairly soon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Federal Reserve also very quickly came to support of the economy. Thank heavens that they did. Uh, what the Federal Reserve did is they cut interest rates basically to zero. Uh, they uh, bought a lot of Treasury bonds. They bought a corporate bonds. They bought uh, municipal bonds. Uh, and they said to the markets, uh, uh, we will do whatever it takes to make sure that the markets are smoothly functioning, because when the pandemic hit, there was a panic. The market seized up for a few days, a week or so. Uh, and so the Federal Reserve team uh, to the market with a, a large amount of money uh, to buy bonds and ensure the smooth functioning uh, of the market and to lower interest rates. The chart that you have up in front of you is a 40-year chart, uh, so it's a long-term chart, of the 10-year uh, Treasury yield, so the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond. Back in 1980, that was around 10%. Uh, then around 2000, uh, that had declined to 5%. And then as we were coming into this year, the 10-year Treasury bond was yielding around 2%. Uh, and you can see that there was a steady downtrend uh, over this period of time. And then the Federal Reserve came in with a big bazooka, if you will, uh, and bought an awful lot of bonds and pushed the 10-year Treasury yield all the way down to half of a percent. Uh, and so you can see that we blew right out of this um, range that we had been in for 40 years. So, you know, it's a really big deal. Uh, the Federal Reserve could push interest rates even lower if they want, 
Uh, the 10-year Treasury bond in Germany, for example, yields less than zero. Uh, but uh, 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 financial conditions are very fluid right at the moment. Uh, interest rates are very low on corporate bonds. Mortgages are extremely low. Uh, anybody who wants to borrow money is able to do it, and the cost of the financing is very low. So an another 25 or 30 basis points lower on the 10-year Treasury yield probably isn't going to spur any new economic activity. You know, that's not going to make the difference between a go or don't go on some sort of a project. So the Federal Reserve uh, has, has done what, what we would want them to do uh, and has uh, provided uh, provided that support to, to the economy. Uh, and we don't really need them uh, to do any more. Uh, they, they've used the tools at their disposal, uh, and, and, and that's uh, wonderful that they did do that. Uh, moving on to the next chart, uh, you can see that all of this money has been a very much of a reassurance to the world stock market. So this is an index of all stocks all around the world. And again, this chart has a familiar appearance, right? Uh, so we had a, a fairly good uh, steady rate of progress from 2016 through 2020, right up to the beginning of this year. Uh, as always with the stock market, there's uh, uh, starts and stops. Uh, but the nice, nice upward trend. And then again, uh, this familiar shape uh, appeared with the, the stock markets around the world, not just here in the United States, falling off a cliff. Uh, where, you know, we didn't know how this was going to proceed. We didn't know how long it was going to be. We didn't know how deep the recession was going to be. Uh, and in the absence of any of that information, uh, the market sold off and, and people uh, uh, preferred to hold cash rather than stocks. But then, again, uh, somewhat uncharacteristically, the stock market turned around a bit on a dime uh, within just a few days there at the bottom and started to recover. Uh, because uh, it became clear that the federal government was going to step in and support the economy, which was wonderful. Uh, and we started to begin uh, to hear information about treatments and vaccines for the pandemic uh, that made it seem as if this pandemic was not going to be a multi-year multi -year event. And so uh, gradually uncertainty came out of the stock markets uh, and the stock market returned to uh, the prior level. So this has been a full recovery uh, in the stock market. All the previous charts that we've been looking at, uh, there's still more recovery yet to go uh, with a lot of those measures. But the stock market has, has made it all the way back. Um, and that's actually also really helpful for the economy. The IPO market is open. Uh, companies want to go public. They're able to do that. Uh, a smoothly functioning stock market is is a, a great benefit to the uh, overall economy, and so this is uh, this is a good development uh, for the world. Uh, next slide. So, uh, just in summary, uh, we have a strong recovery that has uh, absolutely stopped uh, stalled uh, at the current level. Uh, we have new lockdowns that are coming into place, uh, uh, restrictions on on economic activity. And so uh, we're about 4% down from where we were at the peak uh, at the beginning of this, the beginning of this year. Uh, the sectors are being impacted very differently. Uh, I mentioned hospitality, leisure, and entertainment are being particularly impacted because people aren't doing those things. Uh, but technology uh, is really dependent, uh, or I should say we are really dependent on technology. And technology uh, like this uh, software that we're using for this presentation is really making our uh, lives, uh, you know, feasible uh, to work from home. Um, the full recovery is dependent on the path of the virus. I know this is an election presentation, uh, that the purpose of this presentation is to talk about the election. Uh, and I, I'm talking about the virus the whole time because the virus is really the big dog in the room. Uh, the, the, the major impact is going to be how long is the virus going to be affecting us, how long uh, is it going to be around? When can we get big segments of the economy restarted? Uh, so uh, the uh, effect of the election uh, will probably be fairly minor uh, initially, uh, at least in terms of the large macro indicators. Uh, the election, of course, is important, and, and uh, the new administration is going to make um, policy decisions which will influence uh, at the margin how the economy is doing, uh, 
Um, in particular, uh, the uh, administration may well come through with some fiscal stimulus, as Alexi was talking about, uh, for the hardest hit groups that uh, are suffering right at the moment and need that level of support. Uh, and so that's going to be valuable. Uh, that won't have a huge impact in the overall uh, level of, of economic activity. Of course, that will be somewhat important, uh, but uh, the, the major factor that we need to get uh, straightened out, and uh, the vaccine news uh, recently is very encouraging, uh, will be to uh, free us uh, from the effects of this current uh, pandemic. So uh, that's the uh, summary of the economy. Uh, to drill down a little bit more um, uh, in a more detailed fashion, sorry, uh, to drill down in a more detailed fashion on the markets, uh, I will turn the presentation over to my colleague and senior portfolio manager, Kelly Gaines. Thanks, Todd. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the bond and equity markets so far this year, the impact of the presidential election and of policy decisions, and uh, finally, what's the biggest risk to investors. Next slide. Uh, this chart is showing you the U.S. Treasury yield uh, curve for two different time periods. The top dashed line is from December 31st, 2013, and the lower solid line is as of the end of October. And these lines are just showing you the interest on different treasury maturities, from very short maturities on the left side to the longest maturities on the right. And in 2013, we actually thought we were having we were in a very low interest rate environment and yet you can see by this chart that today's rates are lower still and in addition to that you can see that the shape of those lines are different the uh, current line the solid line at the bottom is more flat than the uh, line from 2013 and that's telling you just that the interest on short-term maturities is a lot closer to the interest on long-term maturities. So there's less difference between the two. Next slide, please. Uh, and even though we're in this low yield environment, when you compare our yield on the 10-year treasury to other yields for developed markets, it, it's really quite attractive. I mean, uh, the 0.82% for a 10-year yield as compared to Italy, the UK, Spain, Japan, France, and Germany, and both France and Germany are in negative territory. Uh, next slide, please. Now about the stock market. This is a graph of the VIX index. The VIX is the measures the volatility of the S&P 500, and this graph starts in 2015. You can see, of course, near term, the most recent time period, this huge spike, and of course that's related to the coronavirus. But the time frame before that also had spikes of concern and volatility, and not surprising when you consider there was a Greece bailout, uh, China devalued their currency, there was Brexit, and many other things to be concerned about. But clearly you can see by this chart that the coronavirus, uh, the concern about that dwarfed all the others. Next slide, please. In terms of where we are today in the marketplace, the S&P 500 had a return of 2.8% as of the end of October. Uh, the smaller companies in the Russell 2000 were down almost 7%, and the developed international companies were down almost 10.5%, whereas emerging markets, emerging developed markets, uh, posted a positive gain of 1%. So in any other year, a 2.8% return on the S&P 500 would be considered disappointing, but if you take into account that the market has recovered from that 34% decline you saw on Todd's slide, uh, we'll take it. Um, also, if you include 
so far, what we've seen in November, um, actually the returns on the S&P 500 are closer to 9%. If you add in the dividends, ten, uh, above 10%. So uh, all I can say about that is what a difference a vaccine makes. Next slide, please. Here we are seeing the investment returns by investment style, that's value, blend, and growth investment styles, as well as um, by the market capitalization of large, mid, and small caps. And overwhelmingly this year, the returns have been definitely in the large cap growth area. But you can also tell from this slide that growth as an investment style was the only one to produce positive returns for each of the different market cap categories. Next slide, please. In terms of the economic sectors, this slide is showing you the returns for all of the economic sectors um, from the best to worst, the best being the technology sector. The worst by far is energy. And energy had already had been weak uh, because of the excess supply, uh, but when the COVID, when coronavirus hit, that just killed demand entirely, which exacerbated the whole issue with the energy area. Okay, so now let's look at uh, presidential elections and how they impact the market. Uh, spoiler alert, alert, they really don't. Uh, this, um, chart is showing you that markets have performed well under both parties. Uh, this is the first year returns for the last 11 presidential terms. And the you look at it and you can't really tell there's a clear difference. The red bars represent when a Republican was in the White House. The blue bars represent when a Democrat was in the White House. So there is not a lot of difference here. Next slide. Over the last 75 years, the S&P 500 has produced an annual return of 11%. And that's during Republican administrations and during Democratic administrations. There were two unique situations where um, the, uh, when George W. Bush was in office, and that was, of course, the um, great financial crisis we were in, and then when Richard Nixon, he, of course, resigned, and that was stagflation. So um, those were somewhat unique. Uh, next slide. But it doesn't, if, if you like the president, if you don't like the president, it doesn't seem to matter. Markets don't seem to care about this. Uh, in fact, when the presidential approval rating is low, between 35 and 50, and by the way, over the last 75 years, that happened a lot. That was about 41% of the time. When it was that low, the return on the S&P 500 was on average every year a little above 15%. Next slide. So what happens when we take Congress into account, bring that into the data? Well, again, not a lot. Um, both Democrat and uh, Republican president in office has done well when there's a split Congress, which is sort of what we expect to see, uh, the, with the blue, bar show, the blue background showing that when a Democrat president was in office and a split Congress, the average annual return was 16%. Uh, when a Republican was in office, the average annual return was over 17.5%. So what, what does this tell us? I think it tells us that investors put a lot more emphasis on politics than they really should, because that doesn't drive the market. Next slide, please. One of the topics that has had quite a bit of airplay, and we've actually received a lot of questions on, has to do with President-elect Biden's plan to raise taxes. Here we see that returns every year in the market since 1950. And then also below, we see every year since 1950 when there's been a tax increase, whether it's a personal income tax increase, corporate tax increase, or capital gains tax increase. During this time from 1950 through 2019, 
there were 13 times the market had a negative return for the year, and yet 12 of those times had no tax increases. Only once was there a tax increase that also had um, a negative return in the market. So next slide, please. So the concern that um, higher taxes are an automatic drag on markets is not really uh, supported by the data. Um, when personal taxes, personal income taxes rose, the average annual return was 14% on the market. When corporate income taxes were increased, it was 13%. And when capital gain taxes rose, it was 11%. Next slide, please. Okay, so if elections don't matter and if taxes aren't the big concern, what does matter? Well, there are three things that matter most. The first is the economic cycle and where we are in that cycle. And right now, we're coming out of a recession. We're at the beginning of a recovery, which is a good place to be. The other uh, second item that matters most is what's going on with monetary policy. And the Federal Reserve has used some really big guns to come out and make sure the markets are running smoothly, that we're maintaining the liquidity needed. And the uh, Fed is also telegraphed that they're going to keep rates low for some time. And lastly, what matters most is asset allocation, because that is the single largest contributor to um, an investor's experience. Next slide, please. Given that we're coming out of a recession and that we have a very accommodative Fed, uh, we favor stocks over bonds, domestic companies over international, and large companies over small. And that's not to say that bonds and international and small stocks don't have a place in portfolios. They definitely provide an additional layer of diversification. And then in terms of investment style, I can make a case for both growth and value because uh, companies that are going to be able to continue to grow their earnings certainly will be rewarded in the investment marketplace. And then also, as we see improvement in treating the coronavirus and the economy um, opening up again, uh, those companies that have been hurt during this time, during the pandemic, should begin to recover. Okay, so what is the greatest risk for investors? It's ROMO. We can see the next slide, please. ROMO is the risk of missing out. This slide is showing you the cost of market timing. It's a 20-year time period. It doesn't even take into account this year. So if an investor was um, in the market the entire 20 years, the average annual return was just over 6%. By just missing the best 10 days of this 20 year time period, the return is cut more than half. The annual return is 2.4%. And you can see how this slide progresses until the last bar is showing you that the investor who missed the 50 best days during this time period, the 50 best out of 20 years, or the 50 best out of more than 5,000 days, their return became an average negative 5.5% per year. So to summarize, uh, the data in the uh, market shows it's not related to the president in office, not related to the party of the president. But what really is important is, again, where we are in the economic cycle and monetary policy, and lastly, investors benefit with time in the market, not timing the market. At this point, I'll turn it back to Dave to wrap up. Okay, thanks, Kelly. So to summarize as briefly as I can, uh, we've seen that politics and elections matter, but usually not as much as we think they do. The economy is resilient and markets learn to adapt. The real thing that we have to get past is the pandemic. And maybe the vaccine will help with that, but we just have to get through the pandemic um, before things can fully return, return to normal. So that really was a lot of information. We invite you to give any of us a call if you have questions. And thank you very much for joining us.